Over the years, the Japanese visual novel and adventure game genres have found much success both creatively and financially. These genres have had their lulls in popularity and sales, but series like Ace Attorney, Sakura Tyson, and Professor Layton would help to keep these types of games afloat by introducing new and innovative ideas, sometimes even by pulling in gameplay and concepts from vastly different genres. In 2010, when interest in these game types had started to fall once again, a new series called Danganronpa took the reins and reinvigorated its genre with fresh new ideas and concepts. Its often dark and violent games have continued on for over a decade, offering interesting characters, compelling stories, gruesome murders, ridiculous humor, and unique gameplay. While the franchise has rapidly grown over time and found an immense amount of success, its humble beginnings were not so filled with triumphs as a young film graduate struggled to get his idea off the ground. In the early 2000s, a young Kazutaka Kodaka had been attending college to study film. Throughout his life, Kodaka had always liked video games, and while working part-time at a game store during college, his focus slowly began to shift away from film to video games. One of Kodaka's first jobs in the gaming industry he received through one of his college professors. He worked as an assistant director alongside Kinji Fukasaku, director of the cult classic film Battle Royale, on the cinematic cutscenes of Capcom's Clock Tower 3 video game. He later graduated college and would work as a freelance writer on the Tante Jinguji Saburo game series, known as Jake Hunter in the West. He originally had considered applying to companies like Sony and Capcom, but changed his mind as he felt that his chances of getting an opportunity to create his own story would be greatly diminished at larger studios like these. He instead would take a job at a much smaller developer called Spike. Kodaka spent his early time at Spike as a planner and scenario writer for games like Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 3 and Detective Conan in the Kindaichi case files. He hadn't joined Spike to work on other people's ideas though. He had wanted to create his own, and eventually pitched a game concept he had come up with to the higher-ups at the company. The pitch did not go well, and Kodaka became a bit frustrated. Shortly after his first pitch was shut down though, he came up with a different idea, one he felt much more confident in, and approached Spike once more. His second pitch was received much better, and he was tasked with working on a more fleshed out story concept alongside studio artist Rui Komatsuzaki. Kodaka pulled influence from mystery novel author Nishio Isin, whom he thought took many of the rules and tropes found in the mystery genre and threw them out the window. He also was inspired by Battle Royale, the dark and violent movie created by the very same director he had worked alongside of a few years prior. Kodaka's initial concept was to create a gritty detective mystery game that played like a more standard adventure title or visual novel. This concept eventually evolved into something much different, however. A dark and incredibly violent story that centered around 15 students with specific ultimate and unrivaled talents that were trapped in a special private high school known as Hope's Peak Academy and forced to kill each other in a twisted game with the reward of being allowed to escape. The detective mystery still remained in a sense though, as the player would need to investigate murder scenes and slowly unveil the secrets behind their deadly situation, the events that led up to it, and the school they were trapped in. Komatsuzaki worked alongside Kodaka, creating character designs and concept art as the story was slowly crafted and began to take shape. He had never worked as an original character designer before. But this didn't stop him from creating some incredibly unique characters for Kodaka's dark storyline. As Komatsuzaki created each student, they were given a certain ultimate talent halfway through the design process, and their looks would often be altered somewhat to fit their special skill set. These talents ranged from the ultimate writing prodigy and ultimate swimmer, to the ultimate baseball star and ultimate gambler. Each student had been specifically scouted and handpicked by Hope's Peak Academy, the most exclusive and sought after school in the world due to their special talent. When the students showed up for their first day of school though, 
They each passed out and awoke trapped in the very school they were excited to attend. Many of them came off as very trope-heavy and one-dimensional when first introduced. This was done purposefully to mislead players and catch them off guard throughout the game's events, making the shock of their actions much more impactful. As the students awoke in the school, the game's mascot and most recognizable character, Monokuma, a strange-looking half-white, half-black plush robotic bear, would define and enforce the killing game's rules, while also giving the students special motives to help encourage their murderous actions. Monokuma's design was actually inspired by Venom, the popular anti-hero from Marvel's Spider-Man comic book series. To escape the school and win the game, one student needed to kill another without being caught. If the student got away with their crime, then they were free to leave the school while all of their classmates were killed. But if they were caught, then that student would be executed, often in a very unique and over-the-top sequence. As the project continued, Yuichiro Saito joined the team as producer. Tatsuya Marutani would be its director, and Masafumi Takada would compose its soundtrack. The game eventually received the title Distrust. While official details on the project are somewhat sparse, many of Distrust's early designs, interface, art style, and mechanics changed pretty drastically throughout its development. The game was originally much darker and gruesome before a decision was made to tone down the violence and gore a bit and give the title its signature psychopop art style that included pink blood and more colorful and uncommon character designs. In fact, a lot of the students and their ultimate talents received major changes and were completely overhauled from their original forms. Some of these original talents and character concepts would later make their way into future titles in the series, like The Ultimate Musician, The Ultimate Entomologist, and even The Ultimate Robot. The early design for Monokuma was also much different early in distrust development, strangely resembling that of a human body anatomy model found in a science classroom. One major mechanic that was pulled from the title early on was a trust and distrust system that would allow you to cast your trust or doubt among the fellow students trapped with you in the school. Surprisingly, this feature was actually repurposed as the Ally Betray system in Virtue's Last Reward, the second game in the Zero Escape series, and a visual novel developed by Chunsoft, who would later merge with Spike not long after Distrust completed its development. While never 100% confirmed, Many believed that there were additional features and ideas that split off from the early beta build of Distrust and were eventually moved into Virtue's Last Reward instead. As Distrust made big adjustments throughout development, its name would also change to the title people are familiar with today, Danganronpa. It was the game's character designer, Rui Komatsuzaki, that first pitched this new title, and the team all agreed that it fit the project much better. In Japanese, the word dangan translates to bullet in English, and rampa means refutation. When combined, the title translates to bullet refutation, which refers to a mechanic found within the game's trial sections. At the start of the game, the player assumed the role of Makoto Naegi, a seemingly normal, boring high school student that had the ultimate lucky student talent. He had not been scouted by Hope's Peak Academy, but instead won a raffle for admission purely by luck. Each chapter of Makoto's story was split into two sections, Daily Life and Deadly Life. During the Daily Life section, the player could walk around and explore the school in a first-person view mode. They could even find and use monocoins hidden throughout the school to receive prizes from a special capsule machine. Makoto also could participate in free time segments, which would play and behave like a dating simulation game, letting him spend time with the other students to learn more about them and strengthen their friendship. The prizes collected from the capsule machine could then be given as presents to help bolster the bond even further. After a murder took place, daily life would end and the deadly life section of the chapter would begin. During this section, the player would have an opportunity to investigate and collect clues around the crime scene to build their case against the murderer. The students would then all take part in a class trial to present their evidence and arguments in an attempt to uncover the identity of the killer, referred to in-game as the Blackened. As the story moved forward, the amount of students would steadily decrease as they were murdered by each other and executed by Monokuma. 
During the development of Danganronpa, visual novels and adventure games in Japan had fallen into a big sales slump and did not have the popularity they used to. In fact, Spike had even published a visual novel while Danganronpa was still in production. The first chapter in the Zero Escape series, Kotaro Uchikoshi's Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors, often referred to as simply 999. The game had incredibly disappointing sales in Japan and did not find much success until later, surprisingly when Axis Games published the title in North America. Spike was worried the same fate might befall this new title in the Japanese game market, and as a direct result, a decision was made to give Danganronpa more action-oriented and quick-thinking gameplay sequences and minigames during the title's trial sections to help set it apart from other games in the adventure and visual novel genres. These gameplay sequences would be broken up into four different modes. Non-stop debate, hangman's gambit, bullet time battle, and closing argument. The most common of these modes was non-stop debate. Throughout the player's investigation, each piece of evidence they had collected would become a truth bullet. During the trial, the students would argue and present their reasonings behind certain proofs or events. This dialogue would appear as on-screen text with certain phrases appearing in an orange color. The player would need to figure out which orange statement contained a lie or contradiction before a timer ran out, and then, similar to an arcade shooter, aim an on-screen reticle at the statement and fire the correct truth bullet which contradicted it. Later on, Makoto received the ability to pull a character's statement and use it as a truth bullet against a different statement in the same debate. Sometimes, random purple text representing idle chatter from characters would appear and obstruct the text of the main statements. These would need to be shot down first, or else the player would risk them potentially deflecting their truth bullets. Since both the main statement and idle chatter text could move pretty quick at times, the player could activate an ability called concentration, represented by a green meter. Utilizing concentration greatly slowed down all of the dialogue, letting the player more easily aim and fire at the on-screen text. The second trial mode was called Hangman's Gambit. The player is given a question pertaining to the trial or a piece of evidence, and must fill in the missing letters to spell out and form the word or phrase that answered it. Letters would appear on screen at random and could be chosen by aiming the reticle and shooting them until they disappeared. The third mode was a minigame titled Bullet Time Battle, where the player must shoot down an opponent's constant barrage of arguments by tapping certain buttons in time with the in-game music. As the game progressed, this mode got more complex, requiring the player to reload at times and choose the correct truth bullet to retort their opponent's main argument at the end of the segment. The fourth and final trial section mode was named Closing Argument. This mode required Makoto to fill in the missing panels of a visual comic-like rendition of the events that took place during the murder. This helped illustrate exactly how everything unfolded and generally was the final nail in the coffin that proved the suspect's guilt. As Makoto's friendships with the other students improved during the free time segments, the player would gain special skills that would assist them in various ways during the trial modes. The points required to equip these skills would also unlock as well, encouraging Makoto to deepen his bonds with his fellow students. While the team was incorporating these unorthodox, more action-oriented gameplay types normally not found within visual novels, some of the staff members pushed back on their implementation, favoring a more standard type of gameplay like the Ace Attorney series. In the end, though, the decision was made to keep them in place, and the faster-paced gameplay and minigames helped set Danganronpa apart from other titles within its genre and stand out as something fresh and unique. Development from start to finish took the team about a year and a half, and a month prior to its launch, a demo of the title was released that contained very different events from the final version, most likely in an attempt to not spoil its story. The game would launch exclusively in Japan on November 25, 2010 for Sony's PlayStation Portable handheld console under the full title Danganronpa Kibo no Gakuen to Zetsubo no Kokose, translating to Danganronpa Academy of Hope and High School Students of Despair. The sales for the title were not incredibly high at first, but they would continue to climb over time as word of mouth spread and Japanese writers and game critics spoke its praises. The following year, Danganronpa was released as a PSP budget title. 
Interestingly, alongside its budget version, Spike also released a limited edition that included the game, a collector's box, a soundtrack and drama CD, a small Monokuma plush, and a promotional DVD. In 2012, the game received ports for both iOS and Android devices, though these would remain exclusive to Japan until a new anniversary edition was released worldwide eight years later. Danganronpa would be released once again in Japan in 2013 on Sony's second handheld console, the PlayStation Vita, within a collection of the first two games titled Danganronpa 1-2 Reload. The following year, in 2014, the Vita version of the first game finally made its way outside of its native country with a brand new subtitle, Trigger Happy Havoc. The Vita ports of the game contained new touch controls as well as an additional school mode titled Enchanting Dangan Academy Purely Prismatic Souls. Within this mode, the player must assist Monokuma with creating backups of himself in a character and time management simulator. The player must assign various tasks to the students and manage their time properly so that they can collect the tools and resources needed to create each specific Monokuma backup. Over the years, the game also saw ports for the PlayStation 4, PC, and Nintendo Switch, often being bundled in collections that included other games in the series. Surprisingly, the anime adaptation of the game titled Danganronpa the Animation was the first time Western audiences were able to experience the series when it was released as a simulcast show through Funimation in July of 2013. After the title was initially released in 2010, there were no plans for a sequel, and much of the development team dissolved to go work on other projects at Spike. Kodaka was happy with how his story had turned out though, and wanted to try and continue it in some form, even if it wasn't in a new video game. He eventually got permission from producer Yoshinori Terasawa to write a short series of two light novels titled Danganronpa Zero. They were set as a prequel to the first game and revolved around a student at Hope's Peak Academy named Ryoko Otonashi, who suffered from anterograde amnesia, the constant loss of new memories, and her caretaker, the ultimate neurologist, Yasuke Matsuda. The story circled around an event called the Parade, which was a massive revolution at Hope's Peak Academy orchestrated by the mastermind of the Danganronpa killing game, which led to a global tragedy and plunged the entire world into despair. The two novels released in late 2011, and just like Danganronpa's PSP version, would remain exclusive to Japan. Danganronpa Zero convinced Kodaka that he could continue to expand on the universe and characters he had created, and while he had been working on these novels, Danganronpa had continued to grow in popularity, with sales steadily picking up more and more. Spike took notice of this growth and Terasawa approached Kodaka during his work on Danganronpa Zero about creating a brand new sequel, once more for Sony's PlayStation Portable. and planning on Danganronpa's sequel began in 2011, a couple of months after Kodaka had already started writing the Danganronpa Zero light novels. The original game had a few major plot twists within its story, but with this new sequel, Kodaka wanted to add even more and widen the scope of the project beyond what its predecessor had done. As he worked on Danganronpa Zero, he also began to conceptualize and think of ideas for how he wanted to set up the plot and story for this second game. Interestingly, Kodaka decided on how he wanted the events of the sequel's final chapter to unfold along with its string of major ending plot twists long before he had fleshed out the rest of the story. Some of these events were even foreshadowed in Danganronpa Zero. In Japan, the game would be titled Super Danganronpa 2 Sayonara Zatsubo Gakuen, translated as Super Danganronpa 2 Farewell Despair Academy in English. Its story started very similar to the first title, with 16 students waking up without their memories. But instead of being locked in a school, they found themselves instead trapped in a tropical resort. The resort eventually became overtaken by Monokuma, and a gruesome killing game would begin once more. 
Rather than taking place in just one building, Danganronpa 2 felt much larger and open as the player now had multiple islands that they could traverse and explore, each with their own unique buildings and environments. Navigating buildings still used the first-person view from the original game, but when moving about the islands, the game now switched to a new 2D view of the player as they ran from location to location. After their experience working on the first title, Komatsuzaki, Koraka, and the other members of the Danganronpa team had a much easier time communicating and deciding on how they wanted to create all of the game's characters. The process to design each student's look and personality still took a lot of time, but it was now a group effort and went much smoother than in the first Danganronpa. The students were once more Hope's Peak Academy attendees that each had their own top-tier talent, like the ultimate mechanic, the ultimate nurse, the ultimate gamer, and the ultimate cook. Like the first game's protagonist, Makoto Naegi, the sequel had another ultimate lucky student named Nagito Komaeda, who surprisingly shared the exact same voice actor as Makoto, and whose name was an anagram of the phrase Makoto Naegi da, meaning I am Makoto Naegi in English. Nagito's name was changed to this the very last minute in development, partly for promotional purposes, but also to cause confusion among players as they questioned his connection to Makoto. Nagito would not act as the main character, however, with the player instead taking control of Hajime Hinata, a student who strangely could not remember his ultimate ability and would struggle to figure out what it was throughout the course of the game's events. Throughout the story, Nagito often switched back and forth between acting as both a rival and an ally to Hajime, which was meant to confuse both the character and the player alike. A brand new plush-like magical girl rabbit character was also introduced at the start of Danganronpa 2 named Usami. She would act as the student's ally and is generally considered to be the mascot of the game. Eventually, when Monokuma showed up and took control of the resort, he defeated Usami and changed half of her color to pink, dubbed her his younger sister, forced her to wear a diaper, and renamed her Monomi. She tries to help the students throughout the killing game, but often ends up as simply being a comic relief for Monokuma, who generally used her as his personal punching bag. Many of the ideas and gameplay mechanics remained from the first game, like the daily and deadly life chapter splits, the free time dating sim-like sections, the investigations, and the class trials. Skills for use in the class trials could now be purchased from Monomi after gaining hope fragments earned by strengthening Hajime's friendship with his fellow students. The points to equip these skills would be acquired a bit differently in Danganronpa 2 though. As the player traversed the different islands and locations and interacted with other students, they would earn experience points and slowly level up, increasing the amount of skills that could be equipped. The player was also given a virtual pet similar to a Tamagotchi, which would act as a side minigame and slowly grow as Hajime took more steps. It would need to be cleaned up after and could be given presents to keep it happy. The core mechanics and gameplay also remained very similar in Danganronpa 2's Clash Trials, though each returning mode received some changes and two brand new modes would be added. The non-stop debates now added new blue text statements that could be shot with truth bullets that proved the statement was correct rather than contradicting it. In Hangman's Gambit, small blocks containing letters would now slowly move onto the screen from all directions, and must be picked up and combined with other blocks of the same letter to create a full piece that could be placed into the blank spots of the missing word or phrase. If two different letters collided, the player would be penalized. The rhythm game like Bullet Time Battle would now be replaced with Panic Time Action. Their concept and mechanics remained mostly the same, but rather than using a truth bullet at the finale, the player must now organize the words in a phrase that refuted the opponent's dispute. Closing argument would also remain mostly the same, but now the player had to choose from a smaller stock of panel images, which rotated out after a certain amount of correct choices had been made. Danganronpa 2 introduced two brand new minigame modes for its trial section, which added even more gameplay variety. The first was Rebuttal Showdown, where Hajime must face off against another student that disagreed with him on a certain topic. Rather than using Truth Bullets, the player would now use Truth Blades, though they served the exact same purpose and differed only in name alone. The player must aim sword slices to cut up their opponent's statement text on screen to move on to the next round. 
Once the orange contradictory text appeared, it needed to be attacked with the correct truth blade, which ended the showdown. The second new mode was a minigame called Logic Dive. This mode played almost exactly like a snowboarding game and required the player to dodge and jump over oncoming gaps and obstacles. At multiple checkpoints, a question would be asked and the player would need to steer themselves to the correct answer to continue on. If they chose wrong, they would fall off of the stage and be forced to choose again. Much like its predecessor, as the events of the story progressed, the students would decrease in number as they were murdered and executed, and the secrets around who they really were, the resort they were trapped on, and its relation to the first Danganronpa would eventually be revealed. Danganronpa 2 also included some additional bonus modes and minigames that could be unlocked by progressing through and completing the main story. Island mode was very similar to school mode from the first title. In an alternate universe storyline, Usami, before she is demoted to Monomi, defeated Monokuma upon his arrival, and the school trip would continue as she had initially planned. Usami then tasked the students with strengthening their bonds and friendships by collecting materials and building specific items. The second unlockable mode was Magical Girl Miracle Monomi, which pitted the plush-like rabbit against waves of enemies which she had to defeat with her magical powers, eventually culminating in a battle against one of Monokuma's mechanical monobeasts. Lastly, a light novel titled Danganronpa If could be unlocked, which was an alternate reality retelling of the first game's events where Makoto won a rare escape button prize from the Monomono capsule machine. The escape button shocked him when pressed, causing him to remember strange memories, and ultimately led to him making an unlikely ally who attempted to assist the students in escaping Hope's Peak Academy. Supa Danganronpa 2 Sayonara Zetsubo Gakuen launched exclusively in Japan on July 26, 2012 for the PlayStation Portable. A limited edition version was also released that included the game, a soundtrack and audio commentary CD, a Monokuma PSP pouch, keychains, badges, and a downloadable code for a custom theme. The sequel was rated even higher by critics than its previous title, and sold much better right out of the gate. The title was released again the following year in 2013 for the PlayStation Vita in the Danganronpa 1-2 Reload collection with higher resolution graphics and touch controls. The game made its way outside of Japan to North America and Europe during fall of 2014 under the title Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair. Just like the initial Japanese release, it received a limited edition that included the game, a collector's box, an art book, a soundtrack CD, sunglasses, a mono coin, and a sticker. Much like the first game, it was later ported, generally in a bundle with other Danganronpa games, to the PlayStation 4, PC, iOS and Android devices, and the Nintendo Switch. A few months before Danganronpa 2 first released in Japan, two new mobile titles were made available for smartphones. The first was a free app titled Alter Ego, which was less of a video game and more of a simulation that featured the AI program Chihiro, the ultimate programmer, had created in the original Danganronpa. Alter Ego gave the user access to an in-game clock, calendar, character database, and world encyclopedia. It could also impersonate the students from Danganronpa, and much like the free time sequences, would ask you questions that could be answered simulating a conversation. The second mobile title was called Danganronpa Monokuma no Gyakushu, or Danganronpa Monokuma Strikes Back, released alongside Alter Ego, and rather than being a simulator, it was just a collection of some simplistic minigames that featured Danganronpa characters, like a 2D motorcycle platformer starring Mondo Osawa, the ultimate bike gang leader, and a math problem-solving minigame played as Makoto Naegi. After Danganronpa's sequel had released in Japan, the developers at Spike, now known as Spike Chunsoft after its recent company merger, had already begun to toss around concepts for a new game in the series. These concepts would eventually place Danganronpa into a genre none of its fans ever saw coming. Once Danganronpa 2's development had come to a close, one thing was very apparent. 
Kodaka was burnt out and needed a break from doing projects as demanding as the first two Danganronpa games. Spike Chunsoft, however, had a fresh new popular franchise on their hands and wanted to keep up the momentum. Rather than create a new mainline title, it was agreed upon that they would instead make a spin-off game in a different genre that was much less demanding on Kodaka. Shun Sasaki, a planner on Danganronpa 2, would take the helm as this new project's director, and his team began to pitch an array of different game ideas that covered many types of genres. One of the most popular was a Danganronpa racing game, though eventually this was scrapped near the end of brainstorming. Instead, it was decided that they would develop an action-adventure title with a focus on shooting called Zetai Zetsubo Shoujo Danganronpa Another Episode, translating to Ultra Despair Girls Danganronpa Another Episode. Kodaka was very excited to create the plot and story for a more action-focused game, which he felt was a breath of fresh air, especially after working himself to the bone on the first two Danganronpa titles. Early on in development, the idea for how the game would play changed quite a bit. One concept had much faster-paced gameplay and even included over-the-top elements like wall running, while another was much more survival-based and required the player to be much more careful and constantly run away from enemies. But these were all scrapped in favor of a much more traditional third-person shooter. The game's main playable character was Komaru Naegi, Makoto Naegi's sister. She would team up and be assisted by Toko Fukawa, the ultimate writing prodigy, who was one of the students trapped in Hope's Peak Academy from the first Danganronpa. Toko wasn't simply a writer though and had a split personality with that of an energetic and maniacal serial killer named Genocide Jack, or Genocide Jill as she referred to herself. Originally, Komaru had been planned to have a different playable partner named Haiji Tawa, the leader of the resistance group in the game's story. But this idea was later scrapped and Haiji was replaced by Toko and relegated to a non-playable character. This decision was made mainly because the development staff wanted an established character that fans were already familiar with in the spotlight instead. The story in Ultra Despair Girls took place between the events of Danganronpa 1 and 2 and focused on Komaru and Toko's battle against the Warriors of Hope, a faction of children killing off all of the adults in the city they've taken over to create a paradise for kids. Komaru used a megaphone-shaped hacking gun to shoot truth bullets to damage oncoming enemies, generally portrayed as various types of Monokuma robots. The truth bullets could also later be used for other actions like activating machinery, paralyzing the Monokuma bots, searching for hidden items, and taking control of enemies. During combat, Komaru could call on Toko to use a stun gun on herself and awaken her split personality, Genocide Jack, who could deal massive damage to enemies around her. She could only be summoned if a certain gauge, represented by batteries, wasn't empty. This gauge could be charged by finding additional batteries dropped by enemies. Outside of Toko, the player would bump into a few other familiar faces from the earlier Danganronpa titles along the way. The game also included a surprising amount of animated cutscenes that would be created by the animation studio Lerke, who began work on it almost immediately after completing Danganronpa the Animation, the 2013 anime adaptation of the first game in the series. Zetai Zetsubo Shoujo Danganronpa Another Episode released on the PlayStation Vita first in Japan in September of 2014, before making its way to other countries a year later in 2015 with its title flipped around to read Danganronpa Another Episode Ultra Despair Girls. Two years later in 2017, the game was ported to the PlayStation 4 and PC. Ultra Despair Girls received very mixed reviews among critics, but still sold pretty well, especially for a spin-off title set in a vastly different genre than the rest of the series. In 2015, one year after Danganronpa Another Episode had first hit Japanese store shelves, Spike Chunsoft released another mobile game based on the series for iOS and Android devices titled Danganronpa Unlimited Battle. It was a collectible card-based RPG that featured characters from the first two mainline games. The player would use cards to summon 3D character models and launch them at enemies to defeat them, similar to playing a pinball machine. Unlimited Battle was not received well, especially since it was just a reskin of a different mobile title called Kenkabancho Crash Battle, and the game was removed from both app stores later that very same year, with its servers shutting down as well. 
The same year Unlimited Battle launched, and subsequently failed, production had begun on the next mainline iteration of the Danganronpa series. This new chapter would not be a video game, however, but instead a fully animated television series that acted as both a prequel and a sequel. After Lerke had finished up their work on the animated scenes for Ultra Despair Girls, discussions began to take place about the potential of an anime series based on the second Danganronpa game, similar to how the first was adapted with Danganronpa the animation. Ultimately, this idea fell through, but instead was replaced with another. Rather than just adapting a pre-existing work, perhaps there was potential to create a brand new story instead. Kodaka and some of the other members of the Danganronpa team met with Lerke and a decision was eventually made to create an anime series that would act as the grand finale to the Hope's Peak story arc and be the final chapter of the original Danganronpa trilogy. Kodaka had already begun to work out the chronological events that followed Danganronpa 2 and felt that using an anime would allow for a very different type of story to be told that wasn't locked down by having to worry about incorporating gameplay and coming up with new modes and mechanics. Tying the story so heavily in with the games would be a risk, however, as audiences who had not finished the Danganronpa titles could potentially feel lost and disconnected from the plot and characters and end up losing interest in the series because of it. The team stuck with the idea, though, and continued to move forward. The series would be titled Danganronpa 3, The End of Kibo Gabine Gakuen, or Danganronpa 3, The End of Hope's Peak High School in English. The project would be a joint collaboration between both Spike Chunsoft and Lerke, with many members from the Danganronpa team attending the anime's production meetings. Seiji Kishi of Lerke would be the series' director, Rui Komatsuzaki would create its character designs, and Danganronpa composer Masafumi Takada would provide the soundtrack. Kodaka would write out the anime's general plot overview and oversee the project and story as it moved along. Writer Norimitsu Kaiho would take Kodaka's scenario and adapt it for the anime, while also writing out the script for its characters. The TV series would bring back many of the characters from the video games, but also added plenty of new faces like Chisa Yukizome, Kyosuke Munakata, and Juzo Sakakura. It was split into three separate arcs, the Despair arc, the Future arc, and the Hope arc. The Despair arc contained 11 episodes and took place before the events of the first Danganronpa game. It followed the characters who appeared in Danganronpa 2 and told the story of how the mastermind behind both killing games in the first two titles took over and manipulated the Hope's Peak Academy students into helping them plunge the world into despair. The future arc had 12 episodes and followed Makoto Naegi, Hyoko Kirigiri, and Aoi Asahina, survivors of the first Danganronpa, as they were forced once again to play a brand new killing game with other members of the Future Foundation an organization focused on wiping out despair and reclaiming hope for humanity. The Hope arc was just a single episode and concluded the events of the future arc. Interestingly, rather than a single episode airing each week, one episode from each arc would be broadcasted a few days apart every week and flip-flopped back and forth until the Hope arc finale episode aired at the very end. The anime first aired in Japan on July 11, 2016, and ran until September 29th. Funimation had also simulcast the episodes with English subtitles at the same time, and released English dub versions a bit later in the year. Danganronpa 3 The End of Hope's Peak High School was received favorably by both fans and critics alike, and saw various DVD and Blu-ray collections released over the years. One of these Blu-ray box sets, which hit store shelves in November of 2016, came bundled with a special new Danganronpa spin-off audio novel for PC platforms titled Kirigiri So. It acted as somewhat of a crossover between Chunsoft's older Otogoriso title and obviously Danganronpa. Kirigiri So took place before the events of the first Danganronpa title and starred Kyoko Kirigiri, the ultimate detective, and a normal college student named Kohei Matsudaira. 
The game was mainly a choose-your-own-adventure type audio novel and contained various visual backdrops to help enhance its story. It started with Kohei getting lost while taking a shortcut on his drive home. He ended up meeting Kyoko and offered her a ride. The two later got into an accident and took refuge in a mansion in the woods. The game was spent investigating the mansion while choosing different story routes that could result in multiple endings. Each playthrough was relatively short, generally clocking in at only two or three hours. Kirigiri So remained exclusive to Japan and also to the Danganronpa 3 Blu-ray box set it came bundled in and surprisingly never received any type of standalone release. One month before Kirigiri So's release date, Spike Chunsoft had put out another Danganronpa game, this time for Sony's PSVR headset on the PlayStation 4. This new game would be titled Cyber Danganronpa VR The Class Trial and was far from a full retail release and more akin to a tech demo. It was free to download and let the player experience a Danganronpa Clash Trial in full 3D within a virtual reality setting. The game simulated the fourth case of the original Danganronpa and even let the player get to be executed by Monokuma in full VR. Sadly, the experience was very short and only lasted about 10 to 15 minutes. Some fans were hopeful that this may be a taste of things to come. But at this point in time though, in 2021, nothing has come to fruition. While the Danganronpa team was helping out Lurke with the finale of the Hope's Peak arc, work on a brand new mainline game for the series was already well underway. Work on the third mainline Danganronpa video game began near the very end of Ultra Despair Girls' development cycle, right after Kodaka had started writing the plot for the Danganronpa 3 anime. Since the TV series would wrap up the story of Makoto Naegi in the Hope's Peak events, this new title was considered a brand new chapter and would be very disconnected from the previous Danganronpa games. Its theme would be set around the idea of telling lies with much of its story and characters revolving around the concept. The game would be developed for both the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita simultaneously. With it being the first mainline project developed for more powerful hardware, its scope would be much larger than any of the previous titles, both graphically and narratively. It would be titled New Danganronpa V3 to help set it apart from the Danganronpa 3 anime, though this title would also have a hidden meaning that was unveiled later in the story. Returning from Danganronpa 2 and Ultra Despair Girls, Shun Sasaki would once again direct the title, with Komatsuzaki handling the art and character designs as usual, and Masafumi Takada returning to compose its soundtrack. Yoshinori Terasawa would also return as its producer. During development, Kodaka worked himself senselessly on an insane schedule as he was juggling writing and supervising Danganronpa 3's anime, while also creating the scenario for new Danganronpa V3. Since the projects were very separate staff-wise, it was a huge struggle for him to keep up with them both. He spent nearly every waking hour of the day at Spike Chunsoft's offices writing and writing and writing. With this new title though, he received some extra help with the scenario from Kitayama Takekuni, author of some of the Danganronpa light novels, and Takayuki Sugawara. Since this was a fresh start for the franchise, Kodaka wanted its art style to be changed up somewhat to help signify the move away from the earlier Danganronpa games. Instead of the psycho pop style used before, he requested a shift to a new art direction he referred to as psycho cool, a more artsy watercolor-esque style. The series' signature pink blood would still remain though. Another major change for the title was Monokuma's original Japanese voice actress, Nobuyo Oyama, retiring from the role and voice acting in general after sadly being diagnosed with dementia. The role was then given to Tarako Isono, referred to professionally as simply Tarako, who voiced Monokuma in both the Danganronpa 3 anime and this new project. Coincidentally, Tarako had also provided the voice for the mascot-like character Zero-3 in Danganronpa's sister series, Zero Escape. 
As had become normal for the mainline titles, the story saw 16 students, each with their own unique ultimate talent, wake up in an abandoned school with a bad case of amnesia and forced into playing Monokuma's killing game, where the winner must commit a murder without being convicted. Some of the talent concepts that were scrapped from the very first Danganronpa would be brought back and repurposed for this new title, like the ultimate entomologist and the ultimate robot. As the events of the killing game progressed, the characters would, as usual, slowly decrease in number, and the story would go through many surprising twists regarding the secrets behind the students in their abandoned school, resulting in one of the most divisive endings ever. Monokuma would also receive five new sidekicks called the Monocubs that would interact regularly with both him and the students. They were named Monosuke, Monotaro, Monophony, Monokid, and Monodam. Much like Monomi from Danganronpa 2, they mainly just provided comic relief, but sometimes assisted the students with their investigations. They also helped Monokuma enforce the school rules by using threatening mecha suits called Exizols. The player would take control of both Kaede Akamatsu, the ultimate pianist, as well as Shuichi Saihara, the ultimate detective, throughout the game. While new Danganronpa V3's scope was larger, it still generally followed the same flow as its predecessors, like the daily Deadly Life chapter splits, free time segments, murder investigations, and class trials. Some chapters used some very unique ideas though, like a murder taking place in a VR video game where each student was represented by a small, cute-looking RPG-like avatar, and using a 2D platforming minigame early on as an escape segment where all of the students attempted to escape the school by dodging enemies and avoiding traps. The section that probably saw the biggest revamp was the class trial. It still retained the same basic progression and mechanics found in the previous mainline titles, but nearly every single mode had some major changes, along with plenty of new modes and minigames being added. During the non-stop debate section, the text system was completely overhauled by the team so that each piece of statement text would now appear in a 3D space and could move around and be manipulated more freely, allowing for some interesting visual interactions amongst the on-screen text. Many different fonts were also used now depending on the character's tone or emotion during statements, and even had weak sections called V-points that, if hit with a truth bullet, would award extra points and monocoins at the end of the trial. With the game's theme set around telling lies, truth bullets could now be altered during non-stop debates by holding a certain button which allowed the player to reverse the meaning of the bullet and lie about a specific statement. Building on the non-stop debate section was a new mode called Mass Panic Debate, where three people would be speaking at the exact same time. The mechanics were almost exactly the same as the normal non-stop debate, requiring the player to use a truth bullet on the correct statement but it would be way more chaotic now and sometimes require the player to shoot loud, overpowering statements with their silencer shots to bring the other character's statement text back into view. Rebuttal Showdown returned from Danganronpa 2 with its truth blades and text slicing, however it remained mostly unchanged from its previous iteration. Hangman's Gambit also returned, but the letter bubbles would now be completely obscured by darkness and tougher to pick out. The player could manually light up parts of the screen alongside some automatic flashes that periodically occurred to help make the bubbles more visible so that the correct letters could be chosen to spell out the required word or phrase. Argument Armament, while sporting a brand new name, wasn't exactly a brand new mode as it played much like both of the rhythm minigames in the previous Danganronpa games, Bullet Time Battle and Panic Talk Action. The player needed to hit the correct buttons in time with the music sometimes holding them down briefly to damage the enemy and then place the words at the end in the correct order to win the argument. Psyche Taxi would replace the Logic Dive minigame from Danganronpa 2 and played similar to an arcade racer like OutRun or Daytona USA. It required the player to collect different question mark blocks with their car while avoiding other vehicles to uncover a question relating to the trial. Once the question was revealed, the car then needed to be steered into the lane with the correct answer. A new puzzle-like minigame was also added to the trial sequences titled Mind Mine. In this mode, blocks of the same color had to be matched and cleared while a timer ticked down. The player needed to clear out the blocks to slowly unveil the images hidden behind them and then select the correct one to present as evidence. Finally, the last new mode introduced was titled Debate Scrum. This would generally be activated when the students were split on a specific topic. 
After a unique cutscene sequence played, the two sides faced off against each other and began to start making arguments. A specific word had to be selected from each statement that popped up, which could be used to retort the opponent's argument. After successfully winning all of the arguments, specific buttons must be pressed to finish off the opposing side and win the whole debate scrum. At a certain point in the story, a casino area became available to the player, which let them play minigames based on those found in the trial sections as well as various slot machines. All of these could be used as a way to bet and earn additional mono coins to buy prizes with. In addition to the casino, and much like its predecessors, there were additional minigames that could also be unlocked by completing the main story. The first was titled Love Across the Universe, Dangan Salmon Team. It would play like a dating simulator, much like the free time segments in the main game, and could be compared to the school and island modes from Danganronpa 1 and 2, respectively. There would be no resource management, though, with the focus being on building relationships among your fellow students and the potential of a romantic encounter at the school's hotel love suite. The other two unlockable minigames are linked to the in-game collectible character cards, which can be obtained from the Ultimate Death Card Gachapon machine mode. These included characters from New Danganronpa V3, as well as the students from the original two mainline titles. These character cards could be built up and leveled in the board game like Ultimate Talent Development Plan mode. This mode acted as an alternate history where none of the students died in any of the killing games and attended Hope's Peak Academy together. The player could receive a free character card within this mode, and then land on spaces and defeat enemies to level their stats and acquire new skills. After completing Ultimate Development Plan for the first time, a new game mode unlocked called Despair Dungeon Monokuma's Test. This would play just like an RPG dungeon crawler and let the player attempt to descend further and further into the dungeon. The cards that had been collected and leveled could be selected to form a party of characters. As the party defeated enemies and collected treasure chests, they would earn gold which could then be used to unlock more random character cards from the card machines. The three of these game modes would generally be played in a repeating cycle of collecting character cards, leveling the characters, attempting dungeon runs, and then using the dungeon's gold to earn even more and better character cards. New Danganronpa V3, Mina no Kuroshiai Shingaki, translating to New Danganronpa V3, Everyone's New Semester of Killing, received a demo in Japan in late December of 2016, before hitting Japanese store shelves in the online PlayStation Store the following month in January of 2017, for both the PlayStation Vita and PlayStation 4. It received a special limited edition that included the game, a calendar, a Monokuma strap, a soundtrack and cast commentary CD, and a special OVA anime Blu-ray titled Danganronpa 2.5, Nagito Komaeda and the Destroyer of the World. The OVA followed Nagito after the events of the second Danganronpa. That same year, in late September, the game made its way outside of Japan under a new title, Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony and would also see a worldwide release on PC alongside the Vita and PS4 versions. An announcement was later made in 2021 that Danganronpa V3 would be making its debut on iOS and Android devices in an anniversary edition, but after receiving a delay, it still has not been released even at the time of making this video. The game sold better at launch than any of the previous games in the franchise, but critics had very mixed reactions to Danganronpa V3, especially with its major plot twist and ending. The title would end up being the most divisive game in the mainline series among both fans and critics alike, but still was considered a success by Spike Chunsoft nonetheless. Not long after its release though, Danganronpa creator Kazutaka Kodaka, along with composer Masafumi Takada, artist Rui Komatsuzaki, and Zero Escape series creator Kotaro Uchikoshi would all leave the company and start their own studio named Tukyo Games. The group wanted the opportunity to create and work on new ideas and projects without being tied down to their previous works. There would be no bad blood between Tukyo Games and Spike Chunsoft, however, and the two companies would continue to work together after the split. In 2021, the Danganronpa series finally made its way to a Nintendo console and launched on the incredibly popular Nintendo Switch with Danganronpa Decadence a collection that included the mainline trilogy games and a new spin-off title. 
This new spin-off was titled Happy Danganronpa S Cho Kokokyu no Nangoku Saikoro Gashuku, translating to Happy Danganronpa S Super High School Level Tropical Dice Training Camp in English, and would be released in November of 2021 in Japan. It made its way to North America and Europe the next month in December under the much simpler title Danganronpa S Ultimate Summer Camp. The game had been created as a celebration of Danganronpa's 10th anniversary and was simply a much more fleshed out version of the three collectible card game modes unlocked after finishing Danganronpa V3, but now with a beach vacation resort theme like in Danganronpa 2. It contained the same cycle-like gameplay found in the previous card modes of unlocking characters, leveling them up in the board game mode, taking them into dungeons, and then using the currency acquired to unlock more and better characters. Shun Sasaki would once again take over directorial duties, but surprisingly, this would be the first Danganronpa title without Kodaka's involvement, and also the most recent game in the series, at least at this point in time in 2021. While many people are familiar with the video games in the Danganronpa franchise, the series also expanded out beyond these with an enormous amount of manga, novels, game cameos, merchandise, and even stage plays that continued to build on and cement its legacy. As the Danganronpa series maintained its steady growth over the years, it extended its reach outside of the world of video games and into many other forms of media and entertainment. Probably the most impressive of all these was the sheer amount of manga adaptations and spin-offs the franchise had accumulated, with over 25 different iterations and anthologies since the series' inception in 2010. These manga works included spin-off tales, stories told from different perspectives, game adaptations, and even humorous non-canonical situations among different characters. Kodaka himself even assisted with the writing and story creation within some of these manga releases. Manga weren't the only books that became popular among Danganronpa fans though. The series also saw its fair share of light novels released, like the previously mentioned Danganronpa Zero written by Kodaka himself, and Danganronpa If, which was an unlockable bonus that could be read in its entirety after finishing Danganronpa 2. As the franchise's popularity grew, its characters would also start to make cameo appearances in other video games, like Crypt of the Necrodancer, Attack on Titan 2 Future Coordinates, Terraria, Pixel Junk Monsters 2, Mystery Chronicle One-Way Heroics, Conception 2 Children of the Seven Stars, Kenka Bancha Brothers Tokyo Battle Royale, Samurai and Dragons, Chain Chronicle, Hokai Gakuen 2, as well as many others. The series also received countless pieces of licensed merchandise, including vinyl figures, keychains, clothing, patches, costume replicas, mini figurines, phone straps, CD soundtrack albums, and art books. Even with it being almost half a decade since the last mainline entry in the franchise, merchandise and collectibles based on the games continue to be released regularly even to this day. Amongst the merchandise and game cameos, fans also have taken to creating their own Danganronpa games, often referred to as Fanganronpas or Fanguns. Some of these fan games have reached completion, while others still remain in development. With over a dozen of these fan games in existence, it is a testament to the passion its fanbase has for the series and their commitment for it to live on. The franchise also expanded out into various other mediums like multiple stage play productions, cafe-themed food and drink collaborations, a large and passionate cosplay community, and the previously covered anime TV shows and OVA. Even as the amount of new titles has begun to slow down greatly at this point, the series continues to build on and solidify its legacy through its large past catalog of games and its many dedicated fans. The Danganronpa series will always have an important place in video game history for helping keep the adventure game and visual novel genres alive in its courage to try something new. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, this was a very interesting one to make. Uh, it took a very long time. 
So for this video, I marathoned the entire Danganronpa series in just two weeks. Uh, it was very exhausting, um, but also a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. The series was great. Um, the first game was definitely my favorite by far. Uh, V3 was my least favorite, but still really good. Still a great game, uh, nonetheless. I felt like they were kind of, I felt like they were kind of getting burnt out by that one. You could kind of see it a little bit in, in the writing and pacing um, and how they stuck the landing. But I still think the game overall was, was really good. And uh, I, the entire series was really good. I really enjoyed it from start to finish. Funnily enough, out of all the franchises I've done videos for, uh, Danganronpa is the most recent and probably had the most information packed into that, that tiny span of, I guess, 11 years at this point. Um, I actually ended up having to cut a lot of information to make the video a little bit shorter and to flow a little bit better. So it was a little bit of a, a crazy one to, to put together, but I feel like it turned out pretty good and I was looking forward to covering this series the entire time. So it kind of all worked out in the end. I want to give a huge thanks to Pixel Partners for letting me use their Danganronpa gameplay footage. They're a great Let's Play channel. Uh, there's a link to them below in the description, so check them out. If you're into the visual novel and adventure game genres, I also did a video on the history of Ace Attorney, so check that out. I'm also considering doing the Zero Escape series, so if that's something you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments down below. Uh, please like and subscribe as well if you enjoyed the video. Uh, you know, the usual spiel. And thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.